In early 1944, in the skies over southern England, an RAF reserve pilot is hurtling towards the ground. This was not an accident. It was an intentional but very dangerous investigation into the characteristics of high-speed flight and the forces exerted on an aeroplane as it approaches the speed of sound. The aeroplane in this case is a Supermarine Spitfire. Mankind has long held an obsession with speed. Ever since the Wright brothers took to the air in their Wright Flyer on December 17, 1903 at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, designers and aviators have been looking at ways to go higher and faster than ever before, a pursuit that cost many of these pioneers their lives. Just eight years since the Wright Flyer flew over Kitty Hawk at a top speed of 30 miles per hour, French aviator Jules Verdrine became the first pilot to fly faster than 100 miles per hour in his Dapper Dusson monocoque aircraft on the 22nd of February 1912. The years that followed would continue to see airspeed records rewritten, and by the end of World War I, aircraft were routinely flying well over 100 miles per hour, such as the Austro Hungarian Nola Model 70 biplane and the British Sop with Dragon both capable of flying at 149 miles per hour. World War I is commonly regarded as the first industrialised or mechanised war, and the phrase, necessity is the mother of invention, was never more true. Now that governments of the world had seen the potential war-winning capabilities of aviation, those early pioneers now had significant financial backing, and the interwar years would see huge advances in aircraft performance and speed. On the 22nd of September 1921, Frenchman Joseph Saïd Leconte would fly his Newport de Large Sesquiplan to over 200 miles per hour. And just seven years later, the 300 miles per hour mark was broken by Italian Mario De Bernardi in his Mackey M52 seaplane clocking a speed of 318 miles per hour on the 30th of March 1928. 400 miles per hour would be broken on the 29th of September 1931 by Royal Air Force Flight Lieutenant George Stainforth in the RJ Mitchell designed Supermarine S6B seaplane, recording a speed of 407.5 miles per hour. And by the outbreak of World War II, German test pilot Fritz Wendel had taken his Messerschmitt Me 209 V1 to a staggering 469 miles per hour. And all of this in just the 36 years since Orville and Wilbur Wright made their first tentative leap into the air. During World War II, the mantra of necessity is the mother of invention again rang very true and governments were once again frantically trying to develop their aircraft for more power, more speed. Official airspeed record attempts ceased due to the war, but that did not mean that designers and aviators were not pushing their aircraft right up to the limits of their capabilities and in many cases beyond. The British Air Ministry was determined not to be left behind by developments in Germany and the United States, and in late 1943, a high-speed trials programme began at the Royal Aircraft Establishment to investigate the characteristics of high-speed flight. The aircraft type chosen for these trials was the Supermarine Spitfire, an aircraft whose development was inspired from the earlier Supermarine S6B, and first entered service with the RAF in August 1938. The particular type of Spitfire chosen for the trials was the Photographic Reconnaissance PR Mark 11. As it was a photographic reconnaissance version of the Spitfire, it had no bulky armaments to hinder its speed, and it had a top speed of 417 miles per hour at 24,000 feet, and would typically cruise at 395 miles per hour at an altitude of 32,000 feet. However, air crews would not spend long at these high altitudes due to the PR Mark 11 not having a pressurised cockpit. For the high speed trials, it was stripped out of all unnecessary equipment, such as its photographic equipment, and had an array of speed sensors fitted and connected to an airspeed indicator behind the pilot. A camera would then take a photograph of the airspeed indicator every one and a half seconds for post-flight analysis. 
In February of 1944, at the Royal Aircraft Establishment Farnborough, squadron leader J.R. Tobin climbed into his Spitfire. The objective was to climb to 40,000 feet before turning the aircraft over into a 45 degree dive. After reaching this altitude, he did just that, and as the Spitfire accelerated beyond its usual operating speeds, it began to shake violently. It took all of the strength of squadron leader Tobin with both hands on the control stick to keep the aircraft on a steady path and eventually pull out of the dive. After landing back at Farnborough, the aircraft was given a thorough inspection. The airframe had fared reasonably well, but for a large number of popped rivets. And after developing the photographs from the airspeed indicator, it was revealed that the Spitfire had achieved a top speed of 606 miles per hour. This equated to a Mach number of 0.89, just 0.11 away from actually becoming supersonic. It was determined that much of the violent vibrations were being caused by the propeller. Piston driven propellers of that era had the disadvantage of the propeller shaft being connected directly to the engine. And as more and more power was being applied, the propeller blades themselves would reach supersonic speeds, resulting in shock waves that would pass back over the airframe. As the aircraft itself began approaching supersonic speeds, the airflow against the propeller would spin it even faster. To try to counteract this and protect the engine, a rotor fully feathering propeller was fitted. Just a couple of months later, a more dramatic flight would take place. 27th of April 1944, and the same aircraft is being prepared for flight. Acting squadron leader A.F. Martindale of the Royal Air Force Reserve climbed in and took off from Farnborough Airfield, again climbing to an altitude of 40,000 feet before rolling over into a 45 degree dive. As was the case in previous flights, the aircraft rapidly accelerated and the buffeting and vibrations again enveloped the aircraft. This time, as the aircraft hurtled through 27,000 feet, a huge bang and jolt occurred and the windscreen and canopy of Martindale's Spitfire was completely covered in engine oil. His propeller had increased its rotational speed to such an enormous rate that it ripped clean off. Also wrenched from the airframe was the speed reduction equipment intended to limit the maximum speed. Due to the incredible speed of the aircraft, bailing out was simply not an option. But luckily, the immediate danger of plunging into the ground was avoided without the need for Martindale's input. Because a large amount of weight was no longer at the front of the aircraft, the trim of the Spitfire adopted a nose-up attitude and began soaring skywards. The forces encountered by the high-speed change of direction rendered Martindale unconscious for a few moments. And when he came round, he was amazed to find himself back at 40,000 feet. Now with the aircraft back under some sort of control, albeit without any engine power, he concluded that bailing out was no longer required and he managed to glide the Spitfire back to Farnborough and he made a safe landing. Following inspection of the aircraft, it was shown that on this flight, the Spitfire had achieved a speed of 620 miles per hour, or in terms of supersonic flight, Mach 0.92. The high airspeed over the wings had also induced a warping, giving the wings a slightly swept appearance giving early clues towards wing design of the high-speed aircraft designs to follow. For his endeavours, the Air Ministry awarded Acting Squadron Leader Martindale the Air Force Cross on the 23rd of May 1944. These high-speed tests had taken the Spitfire right up to the upper boundary of its speed capability. But there was one more event that took place in 1952, although its results are somewhat questionable. 81 Squadron of the RAF were based out in the Far East in the early 1950s at RAF Selatar in Singapore. And a small detachment was operating out of RAF Kai Tak in Hong Kong. A proposed new air service for the area was being investigated and so Flight Lieutenant Edward Powells was tasked with taking a Spitfire Mark 19 up to 50,000 feet. The Mark 19 had a pressurised cockpit making this possible in order to take measurements of outside air temperatures and other meteorological conditions to be found at that altitude. After arriving at the required altitude, his aircraft suffered a failure in his cockpit pressurisation, 
and so he immediately entered a dive to a safer altitude. Unfortunately, the dive ran away from his control and he hurtled for the ground. The aircraft was shaken violently as the ground was rushing up at him. Battling with all of his strength and after passing through 3,000 feet, just 910 meters from the ground, he eventually managed to pull his Spitfire out of the dive. And following a safe landing, the aircraft didn't display any notable damage, but the recorded flight data indicated that the Spitfire had reached a speed of 690 miles per hour. That's 1,110 kilometers per hour, or Mach 0.96. This data would have shown that Flight Lieutenant Powells had recorded the fastest ever speed recorded by a propeller driven aircraft. But it was deemed that, whereas the flight tests at the Royal Aircraft Establishment Farnborough utilised specialist airspeed recording devices, Powell's Spitfire did not. And so it was concluded that the data retrieved was unreliable and therefore not trustworthy. But what do you think? Did this Spitfire manage to reach a speed of Mach 0.96? Let me know what you think in the comments. Those high speed trials that were conducted in the later years of World War II, not just by the Spitfire in Great Britain, but also similar trials being conducted in the United States using aircraft such as the North American P-51 Mustang and the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, proved to be invaluable in the development of the next generation of aircraft. And the lessons learned about the transonic speed area would go on to help Chuck Yeager take his Bell X-1 rocket plane through the sound barrier on the 14th of October 1947. Thanks very much for watching. You can help support the channel and its future videos by hitting the like button and consider subscribing.